Hi Nobby, welcome to Conversation on Big Cats and it's been so long but it's such a pleasure to be speaking with you again. It's just I think it we haven't talked for years and years and years. I've been following what you've been doing with interest and I I remember that you were in Qatar for a very long time and and you always had a passion for lions. So tell us where you are now. Tell us a little bit about your work and show us something about your work on lions please first of all latika thank you very much for inviting me it's also my great pleasure to see you after such a long time when i we talked to each other last time face to face was probably when we are both in oxford and and also thank you for your parents to host me in in yes. a long time ago we yes. take my best regards to them and yes i'm at the moment in malaysia After I left Oxford, I lived in Qatar and worked there for 12 years in that desert where I actually worked on hedgehogs which are also very interesting at all. Yes. And the last year I left Qatar after 12 years and traveled around Europe, Central Asia and Africa and eventually settled in Malaysia in December. So I have been in Malaysia for 6 months. and the nearly half of my time of my entire stay in Malaysia I have been under lockdown. Yes. <laughs> so so I am still passionate about lion and recently very luckily my colleagues and I published a whole genome paper of lions in the PNAS and mm-hmm. there have been some international media coverage and I I probably briefly referred to that result too. However, I'm I'm very very pleased and honored to be invited to talk about clients and other big guys. Yes, it's our pleasure, Nobby, and thank you for doing this. Looking forward to your presentation. All right. So first of all, as I told you, I was in Qatar for 12 years and I studied this little lion called the desert hedgehog. So I just want to show you how cute they are. Uh, this is a young individual. and some of my students were doing nice time radio tracking in pretty monotone deserts that was an exciting time however today i i'm talking about the lion evolution and the conservation which is extremely relevant to lion conservation although it may not be extremely important tomorrow's ground work however for longer term it is really a kind of bread and butter for future plan right So biodiversity of course everybody know everybody believes we know biodiversity but actually biodiversity is a very tricky concept so Earth Summit 1992 defined the biodiversity in this way if you read this one of course you are completely baffled because i'm completely baffled as well because basically this is saying it's everything every diversity but science can't really tackle everything Science can tackle limited amount of numbers, but science can't tackle everything. So recently, biologists started to classify certain biodiversity so that we can tackle those each biodiversity relatively well. However, those concepts are not necessarily mutually exclusive. But for major ones, taxonomic diversity, like number of species, genetic diversity. ecological diversity and the molecular diversity so if you apply those concepts to the lions that is interesting patterns may emerge so first of all the unit of assessment the lions are phylogenetically coherent into large lion like cats therefore during my talk i talk about not only the current lions but also extinct christ seen lions which are phylogenetically definitely Uh, closer to lions than to the leopard which is the the living closest relative of the lion so basically lions they belong to this panthera oops lineage panthera lineage whose members are two uh, uh, clouded leopard Sunda clouded leopards, which used to be one clouded leopard, not, but nowadays we understand there are two clouded leopard species. Jaguar, leopard, lion, those three are sister taxa, related to very closely. And the tiger, slightly distinct. 
and this strange animal called snow leopard. Again, those early stage whole genome sort of things may mislead us, and in later stage, it may turn out to be uh, incorrect. But at the moment, so far, scientists consider there is a possibility, and probably this is the case, snow leopard is a kind of hybrid species. I mean, not, not recent hybrid species, long time ago, between tiger lineage and the jaguar leopard lion lineage. That was published four years ago by Lee et al. And they have been talking about both mitochondria and autosoma, by nuclear DNA. And the snow leopard is a result of possibly the result of hybridization between male of tiger lineage and the female of jaguar leopard lion lineage. And they even identified the timing. Timing of, let's say, creation of snow leopard is something that after jaguar and leopard lion split and before leopard and lion split. So this window, actually snow leopard was created through hybridization between tiger lineage and jaguar leopard lion lineage. It may not be true, but on the basis of the current available best sciences, it seems to be like that. So the range expansion of lions, this is the evolutionary history of the lion. On the basis of the fossil record, it's bizarre that such a big animal, the fossil record is going back only up to approximately 3.5 million years ago, when that fossil was not completely undoubtedly assigned to lion, but definitely a lion-sized panthera cat. So it could be leopard, it could be jaguar, it could be lion, but, but lion-sized. That was in Laetri, Tanzania, approximately 3.5 years ago. Then what, what paleontologists believed and disputed lions occurred both in East and South Africa at the beginning of the Pleistocene, just after 2 million years ago. Then, by approximately 500,000 years ago, lions first came out of Africa. Lion evolved in Africa and came out of Africa and colonized Europe by five, uh, 500,000 years ago. Since then, they are basically unstoppable. Colonized all over northern part of Eurasia. Of course, we believe that actually they colonized where habitats are suitable because lions usually don't live in very, very dense forests. Therefore, this Southeast Asian forest, which has been traditionally the stronghold of the tiger, we consider lion never colonized it. However, as you probably know, forest is not good habitat for the fossil to be preserved. Therefore, lack of fossil is not the evidence of lack. However, lions colonized Siberia. Then when Beringia subcontinent emerged during ice ages, lions crossed the Bering Strait to Alaska. The modern carnivora semi-carnivores, which evolved originally in Africa and colonized Eurasia, are spotted hyenas, leopards, and of course, us humans in addition to the lions, and only us, oh gosh, I was a young one, <laughs> I? and only humans and lions crossed the Beringia to colonize from Eurasia to North America. Leopards, such a generalist, very adaptive animals, couldn't do that. Spotted hyena, very dominant carnivores, couldn't do that, but somehow humans and lions did it. So we consider lions are pretty competitive. And then, eventually, they colonized the southern part of North Africa. And are those lions, this is a modern lion, this is a lion fossil from Alaska, this is a lion fossil from southern part of North America. I mean, some of them are literally massive. And are they all the same lions? Of course, this is an academic question that many people ask. And then, we, our work in early 2000 
found out that actually, yes, they are definitely lions in comparison to leopards. However, they are distinct. This green line are the modern lions. And this line are those extinct Pleistocene lions with blue one, North, uh, Southern North American mega lions. And others are Eurasian cave lions. And those cave lion groups are distributed from the UK to Alaska. Even though Alaska is a uh, is part of United uh, part of American continent, during the Pleistocene glacial period, uh, the ice ages, Alaska was connected to Siberia. So this is Alaska was more or less extended part of Siberia, and between Alaska and the southern part of North America. There was a massive ice sheet which lions probably couldn't penetrate. So more or less during uh, uh, towards the end of Pleistocene, Alaska and Eurasia are more or less a similar habitat for lions in comparison to the southern part of North America. So interesting pattern of Western Eurasia is during the late Pleistocene, there were some cave lions, but we realized on the basis of some fossil records, especially around Hungary, modern lions were expanding their ranges, just like Neanderthals and modern humans. So, main less cave lions and the main the modern lions may have been sympathetic. And I literally hope that we can find evidence of hybridization, just like Neanderthals and modern humans, between cave lions and modern lions. But our papers just published last month. So far, we couldn't find any evidence of hybridization. I mean, again, this could be lack of evidence rather than evidence of lack. However, uh, to a certain extent, I was surprised. So in any case, during the late Pleistocene, modern lions expanded their ranges, whether or not they really outcompeted cave lions. So cave lion records disappeared in Europe approximately 10,000 years ago, and the lion records suddenly reappeared in Europe around 6,000 years ago. And Nowadays, we consider those new lion records around 6,000 years ago in Europe. They are modern lions, just like Indian lions, Iranian lions, and African lions. So, basically, towards the end of the Pleistocene, lion colonized almost all over the world. They used, um, and South America, we couldn't find any lion fossils, and Australia and Antarctica, we couldn't find, but basically all other continent, there were lions. However, very sadly, lion range contracted dramatically in the last one, uh, 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years is almost nothing for evolutionary time scale, but this is the possible geographical distribution area of the lion, and in the last 10,000 years, it just crashed. This is clearly the, the still, compared to other big cats, especially for tigers, which are more endangered, lion has still large areas. But this is more or less just less than 5% of the late Pleistocene lion range. I mean, leasing is clear. We humans just kills them and exterminated them. I mean, this is the case for many big cats and also the concerning conservation of something called uh, medium to large body sized wildlife. Always human wildlife conflict is one of the major reasons for their demise. Of course, I mean, there are several parameters that sometimes people may speak about as if they are independent variables like habitat fragmentation, human wildlife conflict, poaching, and urbanization, change of land use, but they are all interconnected as a kind of human-driven parameters. So, of course, lion hunting is still a big business in South Africa, and later I may briefly talk about them. Definitely I want to discuss certain issues in certain cultural areas. Economic incentives are overemphasized from my point of view. 
And in this regard, I'm, I'm extremely pleased to be invited by you because India is clearly its uh, geopolitical outlier. Therefore, of course, we can't generalize something happening in India because it's an outlier. But with human population density of over 300, although they are not doing very well, India still has lions, tigers, elephants, lions, bears. It is simply a miracle. This is why we call it geopolitical outlier, but we may come back to that issue later. So nowadays, they are in trouble. For example, lion facing extinction in West Africa. West African lions are in trouble. And also nowadays, even East and Southern African lions are becoming a, a bit trouble. So in the modern lions, many, many 19th century sexist scientists, because basically we are all sexist, Sexist scientists classified lions on the basis of their manes. They didn't even consider a female lion for classification. This highlights how sexist we are. And also because 19th century scientists or even 20th century scientists, we are a bit racist. So sexist and racist, we always try to use males to try to separate population. And many people considered, okay, there are several subspecies of lions, like Indian lions, Iranian lions, Barbary lions, Cape lions, Maasai lions, West African lions, those lions. Uh, this is an Indian lion that I took a uh, long time ago in Gil. They have very, very small hairs. I mean, just, just like me, I, mean, I love Indian lions. And then a uh, so-called Moroccan king's lion, which some people believe there is a bit of blood of Barbary lion, heavy, heavy mane. But this Indian lion, when they are brought to cooler European zoos, they start to look like this. This particular individual is taken in Berlin, but in many Indian lions kept in European zoos, they grow huge manes because lion, male lions mate. It's a kind of uh, has phenotypic plastic. You know? So, depending on the, the environment, of course, gene is important, but depending on the environment, their phenotype would be influenced. However, there are several things that actually you can still use to distinguish sub Saharan lions and Asiatic lions, which was actually suggested in mid 20th century by a German zoologist called Helmut Hemmer. Ratio between infraorbital foramina, no, no, uh, interorbital breadth and postorbital breadth. So, if you measure the distance between orbit and the dis uh, smallest distance in this so called skull waist, you can distinguish sub Saharan African lions and the North African and Indian lions very clearly. That was a morphological work of Hemmer in 1974, a long time ago. And this is South Thailand, this is North African lions. And then, therefore, India-African dichotomy has been dominating the lion classification for a long time. And in any case, when scientists really seriously start to study lions, there were only lions here and here, and there was no, there was no, no contiguous populations, which there were 2,000 years ago. So this is an African lion, this is an Indian lion, looks a bit different. And this is an Indian lion, and this is an African lion. So this Indian-African dichotomy, has been accepted for a long time. Then, genetic work supporting this Indian-African dichotomy was more or less based on India and East and Southern Africa. Then when my colleagues and I started to collect museum specimens, and again, this is why museum samples are important, we tried to cover other area of Africa and Asia. And we just got a bit of bone samples and we did some laboratory work. 
looks like a bit of Indiana Jones going to the lab. And then we collected uh, samples from historic samples and modern samples of India, Iran, North Africa, West Africa, North Sudan, and some other regions. And then what I was very surprised at that time in 2006 was North African lions are very close to Asian lions. This, this one, India, Iran, and North Africa, instead of this North African lion close to other African populations. I mean, to a certain extent, it makes sense. If you are a trained zoologist, you understand that this North Africa belongs to the, the more or less holarctic region rather than so-called zoolog zoologically called Ethiopian regions, like red deer, brown bear, red foxes are all occurring in North Africa, of course, and brown bear became extinct. But... So it makes sense to a certain extent. Then later, more detailed analysis, we again confirmed the same pattern. Southern Africa, East African clade, Central African clade, West African clade, and Iran, North Africa, and India are more or less sister does. Of course, it makes sense, Iran and India, because Iran and India are next to each other, but also North Africa. But this is based on mitochondrial DNA, but last month when we published whole genome work, still uh, India and uh, Iran and North Africa came together. And also West Africa too. Therefore, phylogenetic relationship between West Africa and to a certain extent, Central African lions to current Indian lions is actually closer in comparison to Southern and Eastern population. So one of my colleagues, this is not our paper, but one of my colleagues suggested traditional subspecies separation lines like this. However, on the basis of phylogeny, by the way, I have to emphasize, phylogeny may not be everything, but on the basis of phylogeny, if you want somebody to separate lions into two subspecies, if you want to separate lion into four subspecies, there are some other stories, but if you want to separate lions into two subspecies, this is a traditional line, but on the basis of phylogeny, more appropriate line would be like this. But basically, it is something like, like this, because when we really sequenced Gabon lions, it was clearly southern crate. So it is something like this. Sort of regions is a kind of probably a mixture, which is a bit of exciting. But of course, me Angola, Gabon, suggests therefore probably more or less a bit of band of separation. Right, so the deep pattern actually a bit surprised us 15 years ago. However, then there are some other interesting things which you may have already picked it up. If you separate Africa into three parts, Mitochondrial haplotypes are so rich in the middle region of Africa, rather than northern region and southern region. Southern region, just two of them. Northern region, basically just one. But in the middle region, eight to nine haplotypes are there. Why in the middle latitude, middle region, so lower latitude region, they are so rich in haplotypes? Lions are savanna animals. They can swim a bit of water and also they can live in some kind of wet desert. However, they cannot really live in large numbers in dense forest. This is why they were not in Southeast Asia. And also, they, excuse me, they can't survive in dry desert. Therefore, this is a kind of scenario. During the glacial maximum, we know Sahara was super dry and the Middle East was super dry. Therefore, there was no lion or there were only a, a, a few lions. And also Southern Africa was super dry. However, then 
early Holocene vector period. Dense forest expanded and desert contracted. Therefore, lions were pushed away from the middle of Africa and colonized the southern tip and the northern tip. And for lions, it was much easier to migrate from Africa to Europe, Central Asia, and India. Then, at the moment, Desert expanded a bit, pushing lions back, but forest retreated a bit, so lions recolonized. This was why North African population may have been cut off from Sub-Saharan African lions. Nonetheless, North African lions still maintain phylogenetic ties with Indian and Iranian populations, although unfortunately North African and Iranian lions became extinct. And also, whatever happens, lion populations were there in the middle of Africa. This is why haplotypes may have accumulated. Then recently, this discovery, lion, one stray male lion in Gabon, they are living in a bit of dense forest as an individual. However, because they probably can't penetrate thick forest, this one, Gabon lion, is very close to southern population rather than western and central african population on the other hand a bit of leopard leopards can also live in desert and also leopards can live in dense forest therefore can you remember lions this region is closely related to the southern part because lion can't penetrate the forest but leopards they are actually closely related to the, the leopard around here. It's more closely related to this part rather than southern part because leopards can penetrate the forest. This is a kind of interesting thing to see biogeography and the difference of ecology and behavior between leopards and lions. If you do the same thing on tigers, I'm pretty sure tiger populations would be very closely related to to within this area, so there is no tigers in Africa. And so this is a kind of leopard pattern, but forget about leopard pattern. And the mini break, because we are favorite subject, tigers. So there are traditionally, again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine putative subspecies of tigers, and unfortunately three of them became extinct. And this is a traditional historical tiger distribution. Nowadays, there are tigers only around here. And our friend Carlos found out that extinct Central Asian Caspian tigers, on the base of mitochondrial DNA, they are very close to Siberian tigers rather than Indian tigers, even though India is geographically closer to the Central Asia. But this is based on mitochondrial DNA. Therefore, if you do whole genome analysis, the, the result may be slightly different. So, so there was a hypothesis that tiger may have colonized Central Asia through India, but on the basis of Carlos's work, probably it is likely that Central Asia was colonized by Siberian route. And also, one of my colleagues, Shujin, and us tries to extract the Javan tiger and the Bali tiger DNA because morphologically uh, Bali tiger and the Javan tiger are clearly distinctive from Sumatran tigers and, and the Malayan tigers and Indochina tigers. I, I handle a lot of Bali Japan tiger skulls. They are completely different from Sumatra tigers. So I somehow expected, more for, uh, uh, genetically, we can find Bali Japan tigers are distinct from Sumatra tigers. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> they are pretty close to each other. So, so Sunda tigers, Sunda Island tigers, Sumatra, Japan, Bali, they are morphologically very distinctive. 
However, phylogenetically, they are very close to each other. On the basis of mitochondria, so still, if we do whole genome pattern, maybe slightly different, but so back to the main stories, that is the tiger stories. So branches that we lost and losing in the lions. So we have completely lost these branches. They became extinct at the end of the late Pleistocene. So we have only modern lions. So within the modern lions, we have lost this branch. There is no lion in Iran, there is no lion in North Africa. And West African lions are not doing very well. Central African lions are not doing very well. And some of those Ethiopian Somalian populations may not be doing very well. So we are doing a lot of branches in terms of conservation of lions genetic diversity. Very luckily, Indian lions may be safe for the time being, thanks for the last 100 years of conservation effort of Indian people and some other people. By the way, those Indian lions are in zoo in Zurich, and the Indian lions, even though they are inbred, they are still breeding relatively well in captivity. That is a very, very lucky thing. And also, those North African lion genetic diversity is nowadays conserved only within museum space. Because we can extract DNA from those museum specimens, even though animals are dead, we can still preserve genetic diversity of lions by using dead animals. I mean, we are reaching that sort of era. Therefore, even though I, I much, much prefer seeing live animals in actually the natural habitat, in the worst of the worst case, we can utilize dead animals or just pieces of animals to still preserve genetic diversity. This is Iranian lions with typical two infraorbital foramina, which is a characteristic of also Indian lions. Again, this skull contains morphological information and genetic diversity. So a scientific question is, some conservations may not work, want to talk about, and I personally don't want to talk about, I want to see lions, tigers in natural habitat. However, do we need free-ranging lion populations to preserve the lion? phylogenetic diversity. Under the current level of technologies, very disturbing answer is probably no. We don't need live animals. For example, this is a conservation area. And if you talk about this area, this is a kind of almost a triumphant successful story of African lion conservation called the Casa Transfrontier Conservation Area. It is almost as big as France, or even bigger than France. It's a contiguous lion population, the conservation is uh, dreamed of. This is the Victorian Falls from the, the, the plain. Therefore, if you work in Kaza region, you love it, you literally love it. You can feel still you, you are as if in, in pristine nature, even though reality it is not. So it is a wonderful thing. And you can still see lions stalking buffaloes, and sometimes they are just swimming, and crocodiles are coming. It's wonderful. Then, on the other hand, very dry, minus 80 deep freezers, no joy, no fun. Which one? This French side, uh, the side of France, Casa Transfrontier Conservation Area, or just one deep freezer? Which one can contribute to preserve? Uh, lions' genetic diversity more efficient. Which one? Probably this freezer, or even the Swiss Army knife sort of memory sticks can preserve digitalized DNA probably more than the conservation area. Therefore, this is a kind of interesting question because of the advances in sciences. Nowadays, we can do so many things if we want to do. However, do we want to do it is another question. This is why I usually say conservation is not necessarily a science. Of course, science is important, but conservation is people's values, philosophies, and other, let's say, socio-economic political factors. 
I mean, probably not for conservationists like me, who is more or less focusing on academic part. But if you have to work on the ground, of course, you have to incorporate so many things. Therefore, except for the values, philosophies, just invest into deep freezer may boost lion genetic diversity conservation much more cost effectively than trying to preserve huge areas. Then, in the near future, we may even preserve digitalized DNA on DNA-like media because DNA-like media can preserve more information than current digital media. So, are we actually fiddling whilst wrong burns? I always contradict, although I, I don't want to criticize those hard-working conservation people. Unfortunately, in terms of in-situ conservation, except for some original uh, victory of local battles track record is so dubious when i was very small in mid 20th century still people are hunting tigers there are many tigers compared to now i mean people may consider 1970s a long time ago no for me it is not long time ago so through my entire life I have been seeing, constantly observing dubious and extremely unpromising track record of in situ wildlife conservation. I, I love it, but I can't close my eyes in front of that hard evidence. So if one tactics wouldn't work for more than 50 years, we should think about plan B. If we don't have to use plan B, oh, what wonderful, but, but we should think about plan B. For example, this is a newspaper article published in 19th century. In French Algeria, they killed between 1873 to 18, 1883. They killed 173, no, they killed 202 lions. Towards the end of 19th century, Already there are many natural history collections established. They, did they preserve it? No, they didn't. They just killed it and destroyed it. If they have preserved those 202 lion carcasses, we can, modern day scientists can extract a lot of information to reconstruct what was North African lion. But because they just destroyed it, we have to rely on only remaining a few specimens. The question is, it is not only it is not only late 19th century. Algerian uh, lions in Angola, the beautiful lion. What happens to Angola's 1,000 lions? There used to be 1,000 lions, something like last decade, and nowadays there are something like 10 to 20 lions in Angola. So even even at the beginning of the 21st centuries, we are just saying, oh, what happens to those lions? We don't see them any longer. So clearly somebody is killing or, or they are dying and we don't preserve anything for future scientists who can do something we can't even imagine under the current level of science. I always consider conservation is a collaboration between current conservationists and future conservationists who can do something that we can only imagine and who may not be born yet. So if we can't solve the problem, just pass some information, some proofs to them, then they can do something. The West African lions, basically complete, not completely, but pretty much decimated. So it is not only 19th century extinction of Babri lions. We are still just not doing enough. We may forgive conservationists in 19th century. Can we forgive conservationists in 21st century for the same reason? We can't, can we? Uh, definitely I can't. So only tiny remains are left. Do we want to preserve them? That is the kind of question. We want, but are we really preserving them? That's the question actually, because we are observing this pattern. Crush. Therefore, at the moment, I have to conclude those apex predators like lions, tigers, brown bears, I mean, they are like ancient Roman ruins. It's beautiful and people want to preserve it. 
but largely their ecological functions may have been lost in terms of their historical context. Lions can still hunt buffaloes in Chobe National Parks or Kazakh Transfrontier National Parks. That is just like a kind of remains of old ruins. We just did it, we enjoy. But this sort of things wouldn't be used as part of everyday office computer network things. So they have lost the function, but we want to preserve them. I can see, unfortunately, the current situation of lion is like this. So lions survive on coins, mosaic art, or, or Venetia, or London's Trafalgar Square, and also India's national emblem is lion. So lions would survive in our memory. However, can we secure their survival is quite questionable. Compared to tigers, the lions may survive in the world for a while. But my suggestion is if track record of in situ conservation is not really good, it is time for us to seriously think about Plan B. And we, we add apology letter to those kind of Plan B for future scientists Future scientists, we apologize, we failed. But at least we can pass you some kind of things on the basis of which you can do something. So that is the my talk. That was fascinating, Nobby. I mean, just <laughs> incredible. What a story and I mean, it's just driving home. But I've been listening to again and again and again in India and it is truly a miracle. Just yesterday I was talking to Dr. Vidya Atreya and we were talking about how it's just incredible that leopards live in, you know, human habitation with 400 people per square kilometer and they survive and Indian people accept them. But it's not true elsewhere. I mean, talking to friends in Cambodia and Myanmar, things are not looking good at all you know laos as well it, it, there's just been such a decline in big species you know big mammalian species that it's really 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 worrying something that a lot of people have been talking about was the wild crew program uh, the long-term program on on leopards so tell us do you know anything about what the views of the scientific community are on allowing hunting to control spillover populations and preventing human and animal conflict. What, what are your views on that? Okay, thank you very much for, for referring to that sort of subject. First of all, I must tell you, there are some differences between sciences and conservation, mm -hmm. as, as I discuss very often. Mm -hmm. And the conservation is, is largely driven by values or, or personal philosophies, or I have to even say schools of thought. Uh -huh. There are many influential people who share the view of, let's say, a school of thought, of utilization, mm -hmm. where basically it is not necessarily science. For example, if we fine tune data collection, for certain things, we can we can publish papers on the basis of many things for supporting any even contradictory ideas. That is a kind of danger that general public must be informed. We scientists can understand it. Oh, that is on the basis of certain philosophy and the collected data in the way A and N C and they just generated interpretation. But general public may not be that much informed. From my point of view, those utilization from uh, th that could be almost, how can I say, policy rather than science. And it is possible to collect data and analyze data and interpret in the way to support it. But definitely then, the, of course, I mean, this, I don't know if this analogy is appropriate or not, but any politicians can pay data analysis who can generate say, favorable interpretation. Yeah. Yes. So from my point of view, if hunting or utilization is so important, any countries which don't do utilizations may face serious problem, like mm -hmm. India. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, Indian lion populations have been ex- expanding without attracting yeah. single single trophy hunter or yes. even even utilization values. But of course, I mean, using India as an exa- example is a bit tricky because India could be geopolitical outliers, and using outliers as an example is a bit tricky. So my view, to cut a long story short, my view is. I personally oppose utilization. However, if utilization would show hard evidence on the basis of bioenvironmental parameters, in my particular case, lions' genetic diversity, lions' population size, then if those two are positively influenced, I mean, if utilization would positively influence increasing lions' biodiversity, population, habitat, then I support it, even though I personally dislike it. However, there is one caveat. Republic of South Africa decimated wildlife. Therefore, if something is decimated to near zero, whatever you do, by chance, it would become slightly better. Therefore, it doesn't have to be hunting, doesn't have to be utilization. But once you decimate things, things tend to go up. The problem is like Botswana, those places, it hasn't been completely decimated yet. How to solve it? And another downside of utilization value is once local people get used to utilization value, you may not be able to reverse it. Okay. Once you are given payment, we humans will never easily give it up. So, so another thing I'm worried about is, are we going into irreversible trend? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so also talking about situations like the West African lions, there are populations of lions that exist where there is not much tourism. Do you feel tourism coming into those places will give a boost to conservation? Or do you think we can actually practice preservation rather than conservation and and preserve those populations of lions without you know interacting tourism into those areas my quick answer is the latter i don't know how long they survive in the wild there are people who are seriously injecting effort in senegal Mm -hmm. and some other west african populations Mm-hmm. I really respect those people. I really hope they would become succeed in terms of in situ conservation. But because track record has been so bad, I, I, if you would ask me, I ask people to think about plan B. Catching them, taking samples, or catching them to keep them in captivity because lions would breed very well in captivity. Right. And many people say, but you know, we have to preserve habitat. Of course, we have to preserve habitat. But if lions' numbers are going down, you can preserve the habitat. I, I reproduce lions. Yeah, absolutely. So my quick answer is, if population is in that level, I really urge people to think about Plan B. Okay, so the last question, because we're now going to run out of time, is what are your views on creating alternate habitat for Asiatic lions in India? There's been this great stalemate where a new habitat was created, there's an adequate prey base, the new state was ready to accept the lions, everything was done and The state that has the lions right now refuses to give them up. The Supreme Court issued an order, but there has been no implementation on the order. How important do you think it is to create a second population? From my point of view, it's extremely important. I mean, definitely Gujarat has been doing a wonderful job. Without Gujarat, lion population didn't recover. So, So, but moving lions out of Gujarat to give them second home Mm -hmm. is extremely important. First of all, don't keep all eggs in one basket. Yes. And however, that is my view. I'm a I'm a biologist in the office. If you are conservation manager in the field, I myself visited the guild several times. Problem is definitely much more than what I can see. However, now I think 
Federal Supreme Court ordered and other part like Kuno is ready. Therefore, I really, really hope the Gujarat people would show, how can I say, their very generous conservation. Yes, ge yes, generous, generous pro conservation yes. on behaviors. Fantastic. Thank you, Nobby. Absolutely fascinating. I, you know, it's just been amazing. I would love to talk to you about so many other issues. Maybe we catch up soon again and do one of these calls. It's so great to see you face to face. So I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Latika. It's wonderful to see you again. And I love to visit India again after COVID 19. Wonderful. We look forward to welcoming you here. And maybe we can go look at some snow leopards together. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. All right. Take care. Yeah, Bye -bye. thank you very much, Latika. Bye. Bye. mother can explain to the cubs what is danger and what is not danger.